Hello everyone and welcome to the Idea Podcast, our second podcast when we decolonize your diet. This podcast is brought to you by the Social Justice Ambassadors Program and MCTV. I am your host, Patrick Ibanez. And my name is Daryl Sain. I'm the co-host. Now, today we will explore the subject of decolonizing your diet. At the core center of this show, we will explore, explain, and expand on how the food justice and environmental justice are intricately linked. So let's give some, um, some perspectives. So for hundreds of years, indigenous people across the world were faced or have faced what we call genocide or land theft, and in many cases, forced relocation. Today, many uh, Native peoples struggle with the devastating health consequences of these ancestral traumas, along with the growing poverty in the diet of highly processed foods. However, a growing number of indigenous natives are working towards claiming back their indigenous food and starting an indigenous food movement for cultural renewal, environmental sustainability, and a way to sort of reclaim food sovereignty and personal health. Daryl, this is very nice and scholarly, but let's convey this in a way that is amazing and insightful, like a skit. A skit? A skit. Let's have it. Hey, yo, we got cheese, you know, in Patricio land. We got cheese. We eat this by itself because it's unique. It's, it's part of our culture. And it's our own thing. Here, try it. Oh, my. Yum, 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 yum. Oh, this is quite delicious. Huh. Centuries later. Oh, my gosh. What's going on? Why are there always Doritos everywhere? What is this? What are all these Dorito cuisines? Dorito cuisine? What are you talking about? This is literally cheese. It was here at the beginning of time since my ancestors came. Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Ain't no way. That's a totally different version of cheese. This is the cheese right here. This is my cheese, my culture. That may be part of your culture, but that's not cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's a that's a great skit. You know what? It reminds me of a book called Who Moved Your Cheese? I think the author is Dorothy, uh, Norman Spencer. So who moved that cheese? Um, as we think about that, before we get, we get discuss this in fully, um, I want to get our reactions to that definition of decolonizing our diet and look at how we free up our food, so to speak. I would like to have our guests, or let's introduce our guests, so they can kind of give us their opinions on this very subject. Oh, yes. So today we are lucky to have two guests in our podcast. I want to introduce our first guest, Sara Hijazi. Sara Hijazi is a second year majoring in communications and plans to graduate in the fall and transfer to UMD to complete her studies in digital media communications. She is currently in the Senate at large and works in the MPI Cafe. And also we have on our show... Uh, we're going to introduce her, and she's going to help me introduce her as well. Uh, Genevieve, can you pronounce your last name for me? Benedicla. Benedicla, thank you. I didn't want to mess up. I'm very sensitive. I have a funny last name that takes a lot to pronounce as well. I appreciate it. But uh, there we go, inclusive. I understand you're a first year majoring in graphic design, and that you plan to graduate next year, and you're still somewhat undecided on transferring to a four-year institution. Mm -hmm. However, it looks as though you being a Filipino-American, uh, you love food and exploring new things. <laughs> so, with that being said, let's have a discussion. Yeah, I would like to hear from Sara and Jen on what is your favorite food that you grew up with and why that meal was so popular in your specific family and cultural surrounding. First, when I was a child, um, there was this dish that was really, really good. And a lot of uh, people around, a lot of people in our culture enjoy this dish very much. It is basically, it's called shakri, and it's, it's a Syrian Palestinian dish, and it basically is yogurt, meat cooked with yogurt and served with rice. And it's a childhood favorite for a lot of kids, and that was one dish that I grew up with and I enjoy eating. Um, one of my favorites would be arascaldo, which is, it literally translates to rice soup. 
and it's rice soup, <laughs> and it has chicken in it, a lot of garlic, sometimes ginger, and you eat it on a cold day, which doesn't usually happen in the Philippines, but over here, it's really nice, <laughs> and it's really comforting to just eat warm rice <laughs> and chicken sometimes, you know? Well, those sound like great dishes. Um, so now let's turn our attention and look at the subject of food and culture. We sort of teed it up already. But let's take a little deeper dive in that. Uh, Patrick, I believe you did an informal review of students around the campus about some of the foods of their culture. Is that true? Oh, yes, definitely. Well, I believe you have a tape for us. Is that true? Of course. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> roll it. <laughs> The food that resonates with my culture is called the fish thali. Um, it's from Goa, India, which is where I'm from. Uh, Goa is, an, is a coastal state and it's very famous for its beautiful beaches and it's a tourist destination. So I love that this dish includes um, elements from the ocean, which is the fish, and it includes it in various forms and um, it's what the locals eat and if I could I would eat it every day of my life. <laughs> I'd say the food that resonates with my culture best is probably potatoes. Um, we're Irish, so I feel like it's a pretty well-known thing. Um, but it's also, you know, a staple at family events and stuff, so everybody really likes it. Yeah. I'm from the Philippines, and the food that resonates with me a lot is adobo. Um, it reminds me of home whenever my dad cooks it at home. It brings me back to my childhood where I have to eat it with my cousins and stuff. And the smell, like, keeps me from missing home. The food resonates with my culture is biryani. I'm from Pakistan and uh, the biryani represents my culture. And I believe that it's loved by all around the world. And if you ask someone like, did you ever eat biryani? And they was like, yeah, we eat it. And it's, it's loved by everyone. That's its speciality. The food that resonates most with my culture has to be ceviche because um, the ingredients that are used are very popular in Peru. We base a lot of our food based on seafood and even though we have a wide range of ingredients in our country, seafood is something that is very close to home for me and I love it very much. And not only that, but ceviche can be made using a lot of ingredients all around the world. So yeah, I think that's the one that resonates the most. Wow. I really love the diversity and the different foods that they all talked about. I wanted to ask both of you, what is one food that, ven that you want to say? <laughs> what is one food that resonates with your culture? Um, one food that resonates with my culture is grape leaves. And grape leaves is something you can find everywhere, especially everywhere. <laughs> it's in all of the cultures around the Arabian areas and it's um, really good. It can be either vegetarian or with meat and it's basically just grapevine leaves rolled around with some rice or some meat depending if you want the vegetarian or the meat version and it's something I really, I really love. Um, in my culture we have lumpia which is like egg rolls fried and you can put all kinds of things in them. <laughs> And I think it resonates with my culture because you see it all the time, just like at red regular dinner, at like a casual lunch, at parties especially. And it's just, it really captures the vibe <laughs> of like togetherness. Yeah, definitely. And that actually leads into my second question, where did you have any particular foods used for celebrations like birthdays, weddings, and maybe even funerals? <laughs> Well, the grape leaves are one. Another one would be usually served together the grape leaves and the tabbouleh. Tabbouleh is basically chopped parsley with some mint and some bulgur, and it's uh, really good. We put it with some lemon juice, some olive oil, some tomatoes. It's, it's something that is usually served together both these and are used in celebrations and birthdays and stuff like that. Okay. More foods we have are we have pancit, which is at parties a lot, including, oh, well, not parties, but like gatherings a lot, including funerals. Um, and we also, it's a noodle dish, very thin noodles, and you can have meat in it, and there are usually a lot of vegetables too. It's very, 
I don't want to say light, but it's simple. <laughs> and that's how you know it's like a solid party. <laughs> 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 so, wow, that's great. I mean, that's a, that actually is getting me very hungry right now, I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> so let's sort of switch the subject and sort of talk about the definition of decolonization on our diet and foods that we typically uh, eat in the U.S. So specifically, uh, why was food colonized initially, and then how do we decolonize this diet? Um, Any thoughts? I think in general, just very generally, it's different for all cultures, of course. Um, when colonizers go to other countries and then find this excellent cuisine and then bring it back to their own countries, there aren't a lot of natives from the original country in the colonizing country. <laughs> so um, when they get to making the dish, it's hard to recreate exactly what's going on in there. And it makes it rarer and less accessible to the people who want to try it. So for example, my cousin had a graduation party last year and he wanted for his party a lechon, which is a full pig cooked a certain mm -hmm. way. And it's hard to find someone who can make it that way here in the States. And he had to, his family had to drive to another state to find a place that made lechon properly. And conversely, if we have, on the topic of decolonizing, if we have more sources of authentic cuisine around, like supporting mm. the natives who live here, the natives who live here and the natives from all other cultures, um, it would be easier to, for everyone to have access to them. Yeah, have access to yeah. them and go to them. So I have this to demonstrate more visually. Um, say, for example, oh. Oh Patrick wow. is, has lechon, right? And you Ooh. make it very well, but it's very hard for me to acquire it because it's so far away and there's like a whole shipping process, a yeah. lot of travel, inconvenient and it would probably make a lot of people just want to turn to their local stores that don't have it. However, if we have more stores, if Sarah opened a store. <laughs> <laughs> so we still have both stores and even Daryl can get Lechon while I also have this. Oh. <laughs> this is very ironic. <laughs> 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 it is, but thank yeah. you for participating. <laughs> Um, this is actually, it's very curious because um, it's very different from her where I do have local stores where I can get meat. Um, you know, in our uh, religion, we're not allowed to have, it depends on the opinions of scholars, but we're not allowed to have um, outside meat. You know, it's supposed to be like from people with the same religious affiliation. Um, people of the book, like Christians or Jews, as long as we know they are. So we have um, local restaurants or local uh, um, people who chop meat. <laughs> and we get our meat from there locally, and we have them all around. So we don't have to travel far to get meat like you do. And it's very, it's very different. It's very interesting. Thank you. Um, Daryl, in your culture and your background, do you have some foods that you serve during dinner and foods for specific occasions? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, we do. Um, I'm going to get it from two perspectives. So on my mother's side, it would be traditional African-American. And those foods, let's say New Year's, for example, they would serve collard greens and black-eyed peas, cornbread, um, some other kind of meats. It might be a, a, 
a pig or something like that or some kind of meat. Uh, and they had some representations. The collard greens were supposed to represent money that was going to, you're, you're going to acquire in the coming year. Uh, the black beans represented good luck and so forth. I forget what the cornbread represents, but it is good. Um, and I think the meat is just a bounty. Now, interestingly enough, on my father's side, he's more Creole oriented. And you are probably used to Creoles in Louisiana area, but he's actually from South Carolina, and it's more French-based food and, mm -hmm. and, and fish food. So shrimp creole is a, a good example where it's rice, tomatoes, okra, green peppers, onions, red peppers, and plenty of shrimp, and a lot of good spices, hot spices kind of thing. So that had no representation other than fill your belly, but you know, <laughs> these are kind of the foods that I remember in terms of having gatherings, we would kind of eat those kinds of foods. Wow. Um, Genevieve, I don't know if you know this, but your boy also Filipino-American. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't know if you have this for birthdays, but what we do is that we serve spaghetti, right? We have this nice sweet yes. spaghetti, but instead of like meatballs, we put sausages. We yeah, we put hot dogs. <laughs> so good. But that spaghetti is to represent um, for birthdays a right. nice long life, right. right? We're trying to live a long life and a fun life, you know, have the best of both worlds. But it's kind of funny because <laughs> she also talked about Bunset and how it's yeah. also short, <laughs> yeah, <Bunset laughs> which we short also noodles. serve in birthdays and <laughs> every <laughs> other celebrations. So it kind of mixes in, but oh well. Anyway, <laughs> I want to thank our guests for being gracious with their time and their talents for making this podcast an idea worth considering and discussing. See you all in our next podcast. Mm -hmm.